Who invaded Spain in the 8th century? That's a joke. The Moors. I'm so sorry. It's the Moops. The correct answer is the Moops. Hey, podcast listener. Even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. The theme of the show is this. How do you get below the blog? You're at your desk, your computer, your mobile, you're listening to podcasts, you're reading blogs, you're taking advice. But on most blogs, there's two things you can do. You can get a piece of, quote, actionable advice, or you can sign up for that person's marketing service. One of the things I've always thought was cool about the TMBA show is that there's been so many different ways in which our listeners have interacted with the show. And today, what we're going to talk about is different ways and strategies that you can use to get out from behind the computer and poke your way through the screen and get IRL with other people who can help you change your life and grow your business. And to do that, I've invited two of the most handsome people (laughs) that are in this living room right now, (laughs) Chris Reynolds hello, and Alex McQuaid. Howdy. So for those of you who don't know, Alex, if he had a real job, it would be called the Director of Operations of the Dynamite Circle. Unfortunately, he works for a somewhat ad hoc organization. (laughs) (laughs) And Chris Reynolds from The One Effect, who basically has started a little mini revolution here in Barcelona. Yeah, I like that. 22 entrepreneurs have moved here to live in apartments that you've set up. You can learn all about it at dcentrepreneurhouse.com. And we're going to tell a little bit of that story on this episode. You came onto this show in March yeah. talking about how Barcelona is this. It's great. It's the greatest place on the freaking planet. It turns out you were right. <laughs> this is the greatest place on the freaking planet. I wasn't lying. <laughs> hey, before we get into the meat of the episode, I wanted to do two things. First off, a little bit of news. And second off, I wanted to list the top 10 cities in our community right now. I think that's part of getting in real life is actually figuring out where people actually are. So we're going to talk about what the top 10 cities are in 2015. First, a piece of news. Speaking of listeners interacting with this podcast, we had one story A listener walking down the beach. Chris, you're hosting a sangria beach volleyball party on the Mediterranean. Yeah. And a listener of this show sees the DC flag. His name was Scott, and he was from Pennsylvania, I believe. He was a tennis coach, and he is a TMBA listener. And he walked by the flag, and he saw it, and he kept walking. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went off in his head. (laughs) And he said, I know those guys. Or I know that podcast, at least. And he came back and he said, are you guys the Dynamite Circle? That's crazy, huh? Yeah. And we said, yeah. Were you the first guy you talked to, Alex? Do you remember? Or was it me? I just remember having sangria with him. That's all I remember. (laughs) Yeah. And he was like, this is amazing. I listen to you guys, your podcast all the time. And I heard you had an event here and it just dawned on me that this is you guys. Yeah. And he's on vacation backpacking across Europe. He didn't plan to be here with us or anything. I love there's like handfuls of stories of the last few weeks of stuff. Like one story is Marissa, who's helping me get my entrepreneur visa, probably heard me moan about it on this podcast a few months ago. The fact that you know, I can't stay here for more than three months. How can I set up a home base with that kind of visa requirement? She flies the whole way from Brazil to Barcelona in order to inform us how we can solve this problem. She partners with a lawyer who's already processed 15 plus of these applications. So if you want to learn more about that, comment, write me an email, who's coming with me kind of thing. It's a money back guarantee. If you don't get your visa through Marissa, she's going to give us our money, all of the processing fees back. There's a few more spots left for that. It's at SpanishBusinessVisas.com or you can comment on the blog. A bunch of us have really fallen in love with this place over the last few weeks. And there's an opportunity, you know, Spain's rolling out the red carpet essentially for location independent entrepreneurs are saying, if you've got your own source of income, we want you to come live here in Spain. Sounds all right to me. Yeah. What's been really amazing, Dan, is hearing the stories of people not even being here for a day or two before they realize that how amazing this city is. So like Jeff Picaro, for example, got off the bus and he just felt this, ugh, 
like this tug and he knew that Barcelona was just going to pull at him to come back and come back. And the whole week he just talked about figuring out how he could do it. Yeah, absolutely. And so before we get into the strategies to poke behind this wall of sound and join up with other people that can contribute to your entrepreneurial quest and your personal growth, let's take a look at where it's actually happening. These are going to be the top 10 cities currently this summer, so take weather patterns into account, that our most engaged community members, so DCers, these are people that have established location-independent businesses, have chosen to live and to interact with each other. Now, one thing before this I want to mention, the importance of place and Paul Graham's idea that each place whispers something to you. And it's often that we're in agreement on this. Alex, last night we were out to dinner and Austin, Texas, which I'll reveal now is number two on the list. It was number one until Barcelona. (laughs) When you said what Austin whispered to its residents, I almost jumped out of my seat because it was the exact word that I was thinking. Accept yourself. (laughs) That's exactly right. Do you want to wear a Speedo and rock out to 80s music while rollerblading down the street? Austin's the city for you. Go for it. Yes. (laughs) We not only accept that, but we celebrate. (laughs) And you know, a lot of times the best things about a place are also the worst things about a place because I do find that that can be a little bit annoying about Austin that it's just so meh you know what I mean it's just kind of like yeah that's cool that's cool come see come sa it's not really asserting anything it's just sort of like hey everything's cool here I think it depends on where you're coming from too because we were talking about you know Dan and I have different preferences and what we're looking for in a city and I think Dan you said you're looking for a little more sex appeal a little more mystery and all that jazz I'm attracted to Austin because it's the opposite of that. It's it's unpretentious. You can meander down the street in flip-flops, go grab barbecue at a food truck, and then float down the river on your way to a concert that night. You know, it's there's just not much pretentiousness, and that's what I'm looking for in a city right now. And, and Austin delivers 100% on that. So the number one city in our community right now is Barcelona, in large part because of all the terrible things you've done, Chris, <laughs> and because of the event that we had last week. And we actually agreed immediately on what it's whispering as well. So what do you feel like Barcelona is whispering? Indulge. Indulge in the world. There is something that's that kind of sex appeal. There's like a directive here that's like the place is just seemingly overflowing with prosperity and food and beauty and cleanliness. Diversity. And beaches. And yeah, it's sort of this cornucopia of offerings. So I agree with you. Like indulge yourself a little bit. Yeah. You know, that's kind of the, the Barcelona vibe. So it's a good place to spend maybe for a few months. <laughs> <laughs> so are you guys open to going down the risk? One of the things that I've noticed about people living in Barcelona is that they believe it is the best place. They do. For sure. I was at the post office this morning and another American was actually blown away. She was like, well, how long are you going to be here? And I said, a month. And first off, sometimes you forget living in this community. She was just couldn't believe it. Like, what, what do you mean you're going to be here for a month? That's crazy talk. Like, you're not traveling around. Like, how do you stay here for a month? The post office guy just looks at me and he's like, nods. He's like, if you want to stay anywhere for one month, it's Barcelona. And I was like, yeah. That's great. That's a great story. So Barcelona has this idea about itself in common with the third city on our list, New York City. I think New Yorkers are pretty universal in thinking it's the best place in the world. So They definitely think it's the best place in the world. <laughs> so number three would be New York City. Number four, Paul Graham, by the way, says in New York, it whispers, get ahead by making more money. Money is sort of the whispering idea of New York. It kind of makes sense to me. Number four, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, which whispers, I think, hustle, 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 hustle. Number five, Bangkok Thailand, which whispers all sorts of things. Depends on what you want to whisper. It's got to whisper for you. Whatever you want to whisper, it will whisper back at you. Number six, Chiang Mai, Thailand, which I think whispers, hey, I'm an okay place. I'm affordable. I'm a good platform for you. Come join me and hang out for a little while. I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'd be curious to see what people think Chiang Mai whispers. Number seven, San Francisco, United States. Number eight, Prague, Czech Republic. It is the summertime after all. Number nine, Berlin, Germany, a location independent hotspot for sure. And number 10, Melbourne. Who would have thought? Melbourne sort of like sneaking onto the list. Honorable mention to London, San Diego, Bali, Cebu, Philippines. All right, Philippines and Medellin, Colombia. Pretty interesting list. (laughs) 
So obviously, if you want to get the theme of the episode, get below the blog, you can go to one of those 15 places. Those are where location-independent entrepreneurs are hanging out right now, or some of the places. Obviously, it's a global movement, but those are places where you can find a high density of your peers if you're running a location-independent business. So let's share a couple other strategies that sort of emerged through the past few weeks. So Chris, I think it would be cool if we wheeled back first and talked about basically co-living. So the Barcelona house is a four-bedroom apartment, or it started that way, right? Where entrepreneurs are living there together. So where did you get this idea and how does it actually work? Because honestly, it sounds kind of terrible on the outside. It it does. It sounds like I'd be scared to go into a situation like that because is it going to be a dorm room? Who am I getting there with? Or a frat party. Yeah. Are people going to be partying all the time? I'm going to be getting work done. First, tell me how it started and what you've learned sort of over the last few months. Sure, Dan. I was on a a Skype call with another DCer and he threw up the idea. He said, you know, let's make a post about going to Barcelona and getting other DCers there and living together for three months. And I thought it was a great idea. So I wrote up a a good solid post, put it on the forum and got really good feedback. So you're basically like, pay me rent and I'll set up the place for you. We can all live together and hang out. Yeah, absolutely. This had been something I always wanted to do. And so it just kind of worked out naturally. We had nine guys living in the first house and a couple guys came with their girlfriends and they lived outside of the house and a lot of weekend warriors. Or Now, are any women getting involved in this? Or is it just a bro fest? In the first house, no. In this second house, yeah, we have our first woman Excellent. that we're really happy with. We finally got one. But what was great about it is, you know, you mentioned like people have these fears of, oh, I'm going to a new city. Do I trust sending my money to this guy? Where's it going to go? What's it going to be like inside the house? Is it going to be a party? Is it going to be a drama? You know, who knows? Is it going to be a reality show? And what we found by starting the house is, is, is we had so many different personalities in the house. But because we all had this digital nomad, online entrepreneur, dream, lifestyle in common, it really bonded us. And so we could stay up for hours. I remember the first two weeks, man, we would stay up 3, 4 a.m. It's just sitting down and talking about random stuff, business, personal goals, travels, whatever it may be. It bonded us because we were so excited to be there and so excited to be around other guys that were like us. And for example, like Stephen Vanderpale, he said when he came to the house, it was the first time he didn't feel weird because in his, his little town, in the Netherlands, nobody was like him. Nobody stayed up till 4 a.m. working on their computers, slept in till 2 p.m. and traveled the world like him. And when he found the guys in the house, it was the first time when he was like, it was so cool because he's no longer the weird guy. He's normal and there's other people doing what he's doing and, and he found a tribe, so to speak. I'm getting old, Chris. Are all these people under 30? Just tell me. (laughs) That's a really good question. Our youngest guy was 23 and our oldest guy was 38. What was incredible is even those guys in their upper 30s and their younger 20s could still sit down and have a good conversation. They could still be buddies. They could go have a drink and have dinner together. In a way, we're all in the same place in life. Like We're all in Barcelona. We're all working online. Maybe someone's more established, but they still have so much in common. The older guys, a lot of times... want to teach the younger guys. The younger guys want to learn from the older guys. It's interesting how when you have that bond, that age can sort of dissolve. Now, you mentioned that couples, can couples and families get involved? Absolutely. We haven't had a family. We've had couples. Charlie Prater brought his girlfriend and they came from Austin and they got an apartment on their own. And so what they're doing is they're participating in the social events. So you were mentioning to me that you guys are like running with the bulls. You're going out to tapas three times a week. I mean, aren't you socially exhausted with all this stuff? Me? No, I thrive (laughs) off of it. I'm rolling with it. I love it. You were mentioning like, you know, people were scared that they're going to be eating tapas the whole time and not growing their business, but you've found the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. You can talk to a lot of the guys in the house and their productivity has absolutely skyrocketed. And maybe a guy is just playing around on Facebook or Twitter and he could couldn't even be working, but just because you see him sitting at the table looking like he's working, it makes you want to work. Right. And so you get out your laptop and you start working on your business. It's inspiring, yeah. Absolutely. So you've gone from a four bedroom to having 22 people come out. You're launching another house or how does it work in the future? Like what's going to happen? Because there's no question this kind of thing is taking off, right? Like you're not the only person that's going to be creating these homes. There's hundreds of thousands of of location independent entrepreneurs that want this kind of situation. 
So what's your plan? So the first house was a test project. And in the first house, we could really tell everybody said, there's a need for it. Let's do it again. So I put the summer house together, which we're in now. We knew people were going to stay in Barcelona. So we're like, hey, let's let's put together a second summer house. We call it a second summer house because summer goes until October in Barcelona. So we have the second summer house going. We have five guys signed up, four spaces open. That goes until October 8th. And we're stopping on October 8th so we can go to Bangkok for DCBKK and spend a week or two in Bangkok. And then afterwards, we're going to go to Chiang Mai because there's a huge following that goes up to Chiang Mai and have a house for a month in Chiang Mai and discussing about probably going to like the full moon party while we're there and seeing other parts of Thailand together. So that's the plan. And then revolving into 2016, what I think we might do is put together a house in Rio de Janeiro for early 2016, see Carnival. The reason for that is, is the weather in January, February in Barcelona is it's the worst time to be here. And so why not go to an exotic location in South America? And Sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's so cool, man. I'm so glad that you did that. It really changed the nature of the event for us having sort of an established group of DCers that were in town heading up to the event. So before we get moving on, a couple of other lessons that Alex and I learned, what's the capture mechanism for people that aren't in the DC right now, but that are location independent entrepreneurs and are interested? Where should they go? They can go to DC on entrepreneurhouse.com. People who are interested, they can kick you an email and absolutely you can email them your plans because I'm sure your plans are going to evolve a little bit. But bottom line, if they want to move to Barcelona in one of your homes, you got space right now, right? Absolutely. We got space. And even in the last house, we were filling up until the last week and a half before. So we'll put you in if we can find you. You know, it's such a great thing and people really want to be a part of it. We want to get as many people here as we can. Very cool. So one of the other things that this brings up for me, Alex, is, you know, Chris really was like that local agent on the ground for this year's event. And it made me think of the power of volunteering. Like there was an attendee also named Paul who was an established entrepreneur who came to a conference. So this is strategy number two. I guess. So you could co-live with people. You could volunteer at an event. It kind of blew me away because my idea of a volunteer wasn't somebody like Paul. It was like maybe a young person who's in high school that's interested in entrepreneurship. Or I never thought that an established entrepreneur would want to be a volunteer. But if you're new to a group or a community, what a fabulous way to sort of accelerate. I know what everything Paul's up to and so do so many other people in our community because he put himself out there and he offered his time. Well, you know what I think it also is, is volunteers are providing value. And when you go out there and you provide that value, you know, just free of will, that's when people recognize you. They realize that you're there, what type of person you are, and you start to build your reputation. And like you said, if you're new to a community, providing value is probably one of the top ways you can quickly get into that community and and build a strong reputation, start forming connections and just building. It's super efficient though too because like, well, Chris, you put a lot of extra work in. It doesn't require that. Volunteering doesn't require that you work your face off. I mean, going to a conference is hard work anyway. So if you're already committed your dollars and your attention and your energy to it, why not just take that extra little click and get the maximum benefit out of the event? So this is a way to almost, you know, people say like you get so much more value out of an event if you're a speaker at the event. This is a way to approximate that with a lot less work is volunteering here at the event. I mean, you got, I'm sure, so many interesting connections because you put yourself forward at the event rather than sitting in the back. Yeah. And one of the strategies when I find a network of people, because I study a lot about leadership and really enjoy learning and, and growing as a leader, is when you come into a new community, you want to add value to that community. But one of the things I do is find the people that are leading that community and make them a friend. And if you can do that, that's what a volunteer does, essentially. And I had no intention of really volunteering at DCBCN beforehand. But you have a guy like Paul who came in, and I don't know how well you guys knew him before. Beforehand, but now you know everything that's going on with him because he just offered his time to you guys. What a valuable position for him to put himself into because now he knows the leaders of the DC and they know him. And in a way, you guys kind of have his back. If you guys connect him with somebody or hear of somebody that needs to be connected with Paul, you can send him his way just because he was a volunteer. Right. And your chances of conversion of maybe getting a speaking gig at the event that you're signing up for when you're new to the community are low. Your chances of converting a volunteering gig are extraordinarily high, especially when you did what you did, Chris, which is you came forward and said, hey, you guys should have a beach party before this thing. And it's like, well, sure. Yeah, we should totally have a beach party. And it was just like an absolute no brainer for us. And I think, I don't know why it never occurred to me before. I guess I just thought this is 
for like interns or this is for, but no, like these like established successful people come forward and say, I want to volunteer too. And now all of a sudden it seems great strategy for me if you're going to any kind of conference. And if you're sitting there right now thinking like, I want to do that, having organized the event and having Chris came to me, it's, it's really as simple as that. That's all you Chris really did is he reached out to me. He said, Hey man, the event looks like it's coming along great. Is there any way I can help? And I was like, well, I don't know. You know, I had my plans all in order and I was like, well, let's jump on Skype. And I got on Skype and Chris literally just sat down and said, Hey, listen, you guys need a beach party and you need cultural events. And I don't know why you haven't done this yet. And I was like, I don't know why we haven't done that yet either. You're right. (laughs) And within a week, Chris had a a itinerary and he was like, don't worry, I've got this. And he got it. It added this a really nice element to our event. So I got to publicly thank you, Chris, where members that come to Spain for the first time, they got to see some flamenco. They got to see the Mediterranean. They got to see some things that maybe a normal conference goer wouldn't see. And, And now we almost see it as something that is a must for a DC event in the future is to have that social element. Yeah, like we were talking about last week over lunch yeah and like to do this as a must you know have these social events dcbcn was your first dc event so we're talking about in real life what was your impression of it how did it go for you and i noticed you signed up your dcbkk ticket like the next day so of course what was it for you that made it a success and what would you change about it too the first thing that made it a success for me is is i went in with the mentality of i was going to make sure that i got as much value out of the conference as i could and going into a, any type of situation with it's kind of like a winner's mentality of I'm going to make this event really valuable no matter what happens. So that's what made it a success. But other than that, like the synergy at the event in the city, everybody being excited to be in Barcelona, having the social events, people helping each other out with the business, you know, learning from all the speakers, all of that made it a success. And I think also what made it a success is it was a new city. It was a new territory for you guys. And you guys came in and we put something together that went pretty smooth. Smoothly, from my standpoint, you got an eight point five, eight point one five. We got we got room for improvement, but eight point one five rating out of ten, which I think is good. I think that says a lot. It's, it's better than good. It's really good because it says a lot about you know you guys relatively. Alex, you've never been to Barcelona, correct? That's right. That says a lot because you're going in blind, so to speak. And then you entrusted me, who lives here, but you guys had never met me, other than the podcast that we did. Putting all that together is a considerable amount of work, and I think it turned out really well just because of how it all flowed together. Speaking of getting maximum value out of the event, I know we were supposed to have general theories, but we're almost like this has turned into how to get below this particular blog, which is okay, I think, because you have been just a listener before, yeah, and you have translated into the community. I don't know, maybe describe a little bit what it was like for you to meet all these people for the first time. Were they who you expected they would be from listening to the show? Because if someone's thinking, okay, you know, Austin's the number two city, I'm going to go there and meet some people. Who are these people? I think in a way they exceeded my expectations because the TMBA podcast, you can hear it and you can have an idea of what it may be. But to actually experience the people is a whole new level because you, you bond with them, you make friends and you help each other with each other's business and that creates long-term friendships and business growth and more income and everything and that's an extreme amount of value it's interesting in our role alex we're sort of like event organizers and community managers and stuff and i get a little bit kumbaya in my head because i'm all about like all oh, these people are friends and they're they're traveling together and all this kind of stuff and then i forget like how much money people are making from these events because you were just mentioning i'm gonna get the most out of it one of the ways that people do really well at our events And so I would suggest this for anybody coming to DCBKK, host your own meetup around a topic that your company helps people. This is a genius strategy. It's a win-win for everybody. So say, for example, I have a podcast editing service. You know, either formally or informally, I'm going to volunteer my time to the organizers of the event. I'm going to say, you know, I can host a lunch for anybody interested in launching their own podcast. I won't pitch anybody anything. I'm just going to teach them how they can do it. From Of course, I own a podcast editing service. But hey, that makes me in a great position to help out your members. And this is a win-win for everybody. And the event doesn't necessarily need to endorse that and put it up in front and center. But it's something extra for the members to do. And I know people that have just showed up to this event and like gotten checks just thrown in their direction because they solve a problem that the people at the event have. Sometimes I forget that. You know, I remember someone kind of came out and said, I just made $70,000 since the last event. So that's why I'm coming to the next one. And I'm just thinking to myself, I guess it's that too. You know, I guess it is a business event. You know, I don't know. Maybe I am a little bit too 
kumbaya. No, I think it's right. You know, and those the people that do those also establish themselves as authorities on the topics generally. And I've seen a lot of the people that have hosted those meetups in the years to come after DCBKK, they kind of become leaders in the community on that topic. And even if they're not immediately reaping results in the days following DCBKK, they definitely are having dividends coming their way the years to come. So there's one other strategy that we talked a lot about. And it's something that Alex, me and you wanted to underline a little bit more when it came to our mastermind format, because we did roll out a new format for this event, which is a lot less centralized content. We had a keynote where Ian talked about managing his remote staff, but that was really the only keynote we had. The rest of the weekend was about learning directly, workshopping, masterminds. And one of the things we realized is it helps to train people how to get the most value out of those things. Yeah. So my number one piece of advice that I give people coming into either masterminds or events in general is to be vulnerable. Come in and drop your ego, drop your pride and realize that there are people in there who have experiences that you don't have and that they have knowledge that they can contribute to you. There's a place and a time for your ego, but it's it's not there. You're there to soak knowledge. And when you open yourself up like that and you allow yourself to kind of show your weaknesses, people recognize that. They recognize that you're being authentic and they're willing to share with you the knowledge that took them sometimes years to accumulate. And the people that I see come out of our events with the most value that change their business build new businesses and just skyrocket are the ones that came in and did that. They dropped their shields and they they came out better for it. Very cool. So we're going to be dropping our shields in October. Speaking of IRL, this community, there's just this massive pilgrimage to Southeast Asia in October. And it's kind of become an annual thing. This year, we're actually limiting the tickets. True. First year we've done it. Yeah, it might get to podcast listeners. So listen in here. You'll hear it first if there's tickets available. Anything else that you're looking forward to with DCBKK? I mean, we know we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, we're about to jump right into it. So there's exciting times ahead. Chris Reynolds from the DCEntrepreneurhouse.com. Huge public thank you to, to all of us who came here to Barcelona for the first time. And you made it a really magical experience for us. We appreciate that. You're very welcome. And Alex McQuaid, it's time for us to get back to work, man. (laughs) Hey, this is Dan beaming in from the planet post-production. I thought it would be cool if we could hear a few of the voices of the people who participated in this co-living situation. So I asked Chris to make a couple recordings for us. So we're just going to roll them now before that outro music. We'd love to hear your voice. If you want to comment or ask us questions about anything mentioned on this episode, we'll have all the links and resources at tropicalmba.com slash BCN. Paint a picture of the life in the house. It's very productive. What I love about it is... You can wake up, you have the series in the house, and as you make breakfast, you always start masterminding. Monetary-wise, how much do you think the house is worth? What you charged, man, it was a bargain, mm-hmm. you know, a total bargain. I'd say 2000 to 5000 a month. Yeah, that's the value that I would see it because I'm working with you guys, and to find people like you guys and pay consulting fees to help me with stuff, mm-hmm. that would cost me thousands of dollars. Oh, yeah. And just being able to, hey, Chris, I have a question for you. Can you help me out? Yeah. yeah. We kind of help each other like that. It's, it's amazing. So just that alone, it's so valuable. You wouldn't regret coming here yeah. if someone's doubting about it. But yeah. I will come back. So I hope that says a lot. Most guys, everybody here will actually come back, I'm sure, yeah. if they had the opportunity, you know. This is Pete Hall, and I'm reporting live from the Barcelona Beach. I just wanted to say a few words about the DC Barcelona house. Anybody that would think about doing this, I would say the value that you get from being around your peers and like-minded individuals is second to none. And the group that was put together was fantastic. So it was the added benefit of having real-time feedback on your business. And it's not something that you would get in your home environment where you have to wait for your next weekly or monthly meeting with your peers. You had it almost 24 hours a day. And the added benefit of what Chris does and putting it all together is invaluable. So definitely do it. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.